ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا انه من يهدي الله فهو المهتدي ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان سيدنا وامامنا ونبينا ورسولنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الله بالغمة وتركنا على المحجة البيضاء ليلها كنهارها لا يزيغ عنها إلا هالك وبعد فإن أفضل الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة في دين الله بدعة وكل بدعة في دين الله ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار اللهم أجرنا من النار my sisters, my brothers in Islam, may the peace and the blessings and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be with you and your family members and your loved ones. I begin by testifying that none is worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, reminding myself and you that the beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the final prophet, the final messenger of Allah. Acknowledging, proclaiming, and declaring that whomever Allah guides, none can lead astray. And whomever is allowed to go astray due to their own wrongful actions, sinful desires and inclinations, none can guide back except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From the Amana point of view, I have been requested to make an announcement regarding a car that is blocking the parking. Please, if your car has a license plate of CKCH227, kindly please relocate it because it is an urgent situation. And we also have Brother Azhar and Brother Zahir, Zahir, Brother Zahir, and our respected sister, the mother of Sister Sabah, who passed away, and Brother Zahir, who is uh, experiencing a bit of illness. We ask Allah to give him shifa, Ya Rabb Ameen, and we ask Allah to give Sister Sabah's mother the highest level of firdaus, Ya Rabb Ameen. And any, any other member in the community who's struggling with any sickness, any difficulty, any challenge, may Allah give them tenacity and full shifa, Ya Rabb Ameen. He is over all things capable. Allahumma ameen. My brothers and my sisters, I see a lot of young people in the audience because it is a P-Day day. Some of you have the day off from school. Some of you are staying home. And this is a good opportunity to welcome young people into the masjid. To welcome young people into the masjid. The Prophet Muhammad Sallam was very welcoming of the people, the young people, the youth to the masjid. As a matter of fact, Whenever he would go for a trip outside of Medina, whether he went for a ghazwa, a battle, whether he went for a trip, a business trip, whether he went for travel, as soon as he would come back, he would usually come back early in the morning after Fajr. So it's bright, it's early in the morning for the community to receive him. And the first people to receive him would be the young children of Medina. They would gather around him and they would jump up and down and they would say, Ya Rasulullah, can we play with you? Even though the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu would be tired, would be exhausted, would sometimes have blood from the battle, would have bruises and scars, he would spend time with the children of Medina and he would play with them until they were exhausted, until they would go home. And these children of Medina, when they grow older and now they're seniors, they're adults, they would tease each other as now companions, senior companions, and they would say, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu loved me more than he loved you, jokingly. Why? Because he actually put me on the horse twice. He only put you once. Or he put me on the horse or the camel twice. He only put you once. Because the Prophet Muhammad Sallam would take them and he would have them play on the camel or the horse. And then the companion would say back, actually, he loved me more than he loved you because he put me in front of him and he put you behind him. So they would tease each other like that, reminiscing, remembering the moments they shared with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Not only that, but even in the masjid, the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, when he would go for sujood, it would be his grandchildren like Umayma and Zuaynib and others, Hassan and Hussein, who would come and climb on his back. And he would increase the time of sujood for so long that some of the companions would wonder, is he dead? Did the Prophet Muhammad Sallam pass away? Did something happen to him? So they would look up to make sure that he's okay. And they would see that the Prophet Muhammad Sallam is elongating the sujood because one of the children is on his back. And as a matter of fact, in the khutbah, the Prophet Muhammad Sallam was once giving the khutbah and he saw at the back of the masjid one of his uh, grandchildren, like Hassan or Hussein, walking to the front of the masjid. 
But the soul was too long, so it was dragging. So he feared that this child would trip. So the Prophet Muhammad interrupted the khutbah, came down the stairs of the mimbar, walked to the grandson, picked him up, and some say it was actually both of them. It was Hassan Hussein picked both of them up, came back up to the mimbar, and sat them next to him, and he made the remark, I saw that the thob was too long, so my heart could not tolerate or endure the possibility of them tripping. I could not focus, knowing there was a chance for them to fall or a chance for them to trip. This was the rahmah of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This was the welcoming attitude that he had to the people, to the children of Medina specifically. And it's no wonder that these children would grow to love the Prophet ﷺ, to love what he loved and to dislike what he disliked. You know, some of the children of Medina, they would be asked, why do you like this type of food? They would say the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ loved it, and I fell in love with the food out of love with the Prophet ﷺ. And why do you not eat this food often? I didn't see the Prophet Muhammad eating it, so I refrain from it out of love for the Prophet Imagine reaching a point where you don't just follow the commandments, you don't just follow the sunnah, you follow even the etiquette, you follow the personal preferences of the Prophet out of love. Like Ibn Umar, who grew up around the Prophet he would walk and he would say, I take pride in walking like the Prophet used to. He would sit like the Prophet Muhammad used to. And whenever he would travel, even though there would be a shortcut now that the city is, is, is bigger, more infrastructure, more roads, he would say, I'm not going to take this road. I'm going to take the road that the Prophet Muhammad used to take. For example, the Prophet Muhammad every Saturday morning, he would visit the people of Quba. Because when he came to Medina, he stayed a little bit of time before coming to Medina with the people of Quba, and they were so happy. They were so excited to see him that they wanted him to stay, but Allah commanded him to continue to Medina. So he made a promise that I would come back and visit you as often as I can. When the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, passed away, Ibn Umar said, I will continue to visit the people of Quba like the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, used to, even though he did not command us to, but I will do it out of expression of the love for the Prophet Imagine reaching a point where you love somebody to that extent. And it wasn't just his family, it wasn't just his grandchildren, it wasn't just his daughter Fatima, it was the children of Medina collectively. The children of Medina collectively. We have, for example, the narration that is in Bukhari, where the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, sees a bunch of kids playing with water in the streets of Medina. And back then water was not abundant, so they're just spraying water at each other, there's a freshly dug well, there's freshly available water. So they're playing with the water. The Prophet Muhammad Sallam comes, and as soon as they see him, they stop. They freeze. They're scared. Is the Prophet going to say something about wasting? What does he do? He smiles, and he takes just a little bit of the water at the tips of his finger, and he sprinkles it in their faces to play with them, but to teach them indirectly, yes, play, but don't be extravagant. And he taught us, even if you're sitting, at the bed of a river, if you're sitting at the tip of a river, you have all the water available in the world, and you're making wudu, which is an act of worship, do not overuse the water. Don't waste the water. This is he, sallallahu alayhi wa When he would walk into the house, Fatima would get up for him, and she would kiss him on the forehead, and she would kiss him on the, fore, on, on, on the hand, out of respect. But how did she learn that? Because whenever she walked in, the Prophet Muhammad sallam, would do the same. He taught her by doing. He would kiss her on the forehead. He would kiss her on the hand out of respect for when she entered. And again, not just the family. If you look at uh, Anas ibn Malik who served the Prophet sallam, for 10 years. Imagine 10 years serving the Prophet sallam, What did Anas say? Anas, the Prophet Muhammad sallam, made three du'as for him. He said, oh Anas, may Allah give you a long blessed life. May Allah give you lots of children. And may Allah make you successful in your risk. May Allah give you lots of wealth. Anas ibn Malik lived to be the second last companion to die. He was the second last companion to have seen the Prophet Muhammad sallam, And he taught many of the tabi'een about the etiquettes and the behavior of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And he traveled the world. And he had a successful business. And he had more than 36 children and grandchildren. So all three du'as that the Prophet Muhammad sallam, made for him came true. And now Anas in his 90s, some say he lived to be 102, some say around 99. 
in that range. So now that he's an older man coming back to visit Medina, walking into the streets of Medina with his cane, the children of Medina, of the Tabi'een, the second, third generation of Muslims flock towards him. And they form a circle around him saying, we are now seeing with our own eyes the man who saw the Prophet ﷺ with his own eyes. What an amazing moment. So they asked him, describe the Prophet to us. What was he like, sallallahu alayhi wa You witnessed him as a kid. You were 10 years old when you spent time with him, sallallahu alayhi wa And you spent 10 years with him. What was it like? What were those 10 years like? He said, wallahi, in the 10 years that I served the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa never have my hands touched anything softer. Never have my nose smelled anything better in, 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 in smell, in odor. And in the years that I served him, never did he ask me, why did you do this? Why didn't you do this? He never asked those questions and never did he say no to anybody that came to ask. If he found a way he could accommodate and if he would not be able to, he would find the nicest and the most beautiful way to tell that person I'm unable to at this time. This was the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And he went on to tell them some of the stories including the narration that we have in Sahih Muslim and others where the Prophet Muhammad Sallam took one of the young people with him, one of the young children, to a meal. He was invited for food and he took one of the children with him for food. And this child sat on the right of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and on the left of the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, two wise men, the likes of Abu Bakr and Umar, with full beards. And back then they would share the same mug, they would share the same container for food for water food and water were not as abundant as they are today so they would give out of respect to the prophet muhammad sallam to drink first and he would drink and after drinking the prophet muhammad sallam had to make a decision should he pass it to the young boy who's on the right and if he passes it to the right he would be maintaining his sunnah but he may show disrespect to the two wise men and if he passes it to the left he would be showing respect to the two wise men, but he would break in the sunnah. Because the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is to pass from right to left. So what does he say? He looks to that young boy and he says, Do you give me permission? Imagine the Prophet ﷺ is asking permission from a young boy. Do you give me permission to allow the two wise men to drink? And the boy says, no, I don't give you permission. Imagine if this was us in a seating where there's food being served with family. This would be the beginning of a tarbiyah session. But the Prophet ﷺ simply smiled and he says, Laka hadha. it is your right. I'm not going to take your right away. It wasn't just an illusion of a question. Sometimes we ask our kids a question, but it's really not a question. It's a command. But here the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ understood and he gave it to him, like had, it is your right. And the scholars of hadith, they comment on this and they say, perhaps that young boy wanted to consolidate on the blessing of drinking from the same place where the lips of the Prophet ﷺ touched. The barakah of the Prophet ﷺ when he was alive, that the companions understood was a blessing not to be taken for granted. And they loved him so much that they wanted to attach onto anything, any memory that they could of him. Anything that they could remember him through, anything that they could create the bond with, not just through the ibadah and the action, which they all did and the sunnah, which they all followed. But all of them wanted something special to attach with the Prophet ﷺ through. And amazingly, subhanAllah, the same situation happens with the mu'adhin, the little mu'adhin, the young mu'adhin. When the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ entered Mecca, and when he entered Mecca, all of the people of Mecca gathered. Prophet Muhammad ﷺ commanded Bilal to get up on top of the Kaaba after the idols were cleared out of the Kaaba, and he asked Bilal to give adhan. And when Bilal gave adhan in Mecca, there were some young kids at the side playing, joking, making fun of the adhan. Among them was Abi Mahdura. And the Prophet ﷺ, when he heard this, the companions told him, "There's a young person making fun of the adhan." The Prophet ﷺ went and talked to him gently explained Islam to him gently, told him this is the message of Islam, and he became Muslim even though he was making fun of the Adhan. He became Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ did not rebuke him, 
did not hurt him because he was not Muslim at the time. We are Muslims. We should not be making fun of the Adhan. There's special rules applying to us. But that boy did not know at that time. So he was gentle with him, taught him Islam. He became Muslim and he was assigned to be the official Mu'adhin of Mecca. And he served as the Mu'adhin for Mecca for a long time. And there's actually a specific Adhan called the Adhan of Abi Mahdura. Specific Adhan that the Prophet taught him through. And it's in this Adhan that he becomes Muslim. He says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. So this Adhan has an extra shahadatain in it because Abi Mahdura becomes Muslim as he's learning the Adhan. He's learning the words of the Adhan and as he's learning them, he understands what they mean. So he says them from his heart. And that becomes the official Adhan for Mecca for years to come. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallam touched this young boy on the, on, on the head, on the hair, making dua for him. May Allah bless you. Some narrations say that he refused to cut his hair. He refused to cut his hair for years because he wanted to get that blessing of remembering that moment with the Prophet Wasallam. These were the children that he was around. And when you talk about the youth, that's a different story. Think about all of the youth that the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam inspired. Whether it was Ibn Umar and he told him, if you have a question, ask in the middle of the halaqa. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to raise your hand. And Umar taught him the same. Whether it was Usama ibn Zayd and he told him, he assigned him to be the leader of an army that had the likes of Abu Bakr and Umar in it. So the first part of the khutbah, I want to just make it very clear that this masjid is the home to the young. As it is the home to the seniors. As it is the home to the brothers. As it is the home to the sisters. It is everybody's home and it's everybody's community. And one of the things that saddens when you see, especially when young kids walk in, imagine you as a father, you as an uncle, you as someone who's a bit older, you see your friend who's in your age, a father as well, or a mother as well. And you see their little kids with them. Often you will say salam to the father, to the mother, but you will not say salam to the kids. Because we're not used to it. But the Prophet Muhammad Sallam would come down to the level where he's making eye contact with the children and he would shake hands with them and he would have his hand at the bottom and he would ask them for their names and he would ask them, how is your family doing? And if one of them told him, my mother is sick, my father is sick, if the Prophet Muhammad Sallam met them weeks later, he would still remember and he would ask, how is your father doing now? How is your mother doing now? In order for us to create that space where young people feel welcome, it's the duty of everybody here. And wallahi, society makes it difficult outside. Our young people are constantly being questioned. Their identity is being questioned. Their, their belonging is being questioned. Their faith is being questioned. All kinds of crisis that they experience, the least we can do when they walk into this masjid is make it feel like it's their home. And to be patient with their mistakes. And to advise in a gentle manner. And to show respect. And to give them that respectful welcome in the masjid through a gentle word, a smile, through a treat that you have in your hand, something that's sugar free so that his mother or her mother doesn't get upset with you if they're avoiding sugar. But anything that you have that you could give out of respect to feel or to give them the sense of belonging. And now my message to our young children who have come to the masjid today, this month coming up, we have the month of Dhul Hijjah, the month in which we're remembering Ibrahim. And Allah says regarding Ibrahim, alayhi salatu wasalam, inna Ibrahim kana ummatan. Ibrahim was a whole ummah by himself. Imagine Ibrahim reached the level where he was not just an individual in his impact, he became a whole nation. Why? وَإِذِ بَتَلَى إِبْرَاهِيمَ رَبُّهُ بِكَلِمَاتٍ فَأَتَمَّهُنَّ قَالَ إِنِّي جَاعِلُكَ لِلنَّاسِ إِمَامًا When Allah tested Ibrahim with one test after the other test after the other test, he endured, he passed all of those tests. As a result of his patience, as a result of his passing the test, Allah says, I am making you an imam, not just for a small group of people, I'm making you an imam for humanity. So the Christians claim Ibrahim. The Jewish communities claim Ibrahim. And we, of course, as Muslims, we claim him more than anybody else. 
ما كان إبراهيم يهوديا ولا نصرانيا ولكن كان حنيفا مسلما وما كان من المشركين إبراهيم was not a Jew nor was he a Christian these things came after him what did he practice? he practiced Islam saying Ya Allah I submit my will to you he practiced Islam in the sense that he says Ya Allah whatever I have it's because of you you gave it to me so I give it back to you إن صلاتي ونسكي ومحياي ومماتي لله رب العالمين. This Hajj, this month, we're celebrating his story, his sacrifice. What was his life motto? What did he live by? He says, my salah, my ritual. Salati, my prayer. ونسكي, my sacrifice. How I treat animals. How I treat Allah in my worship. How I treat other beings, animals. How I sacrifice. وَمَحْيَايَ How I live وَمَمَاتِ And how I die All of it is going to be through what you tell me, Ya Allah Because nobody else has the right to tell me what to do Except the one who created me and the one who made me And we're living in a time Where there are lots of people trying to Define what is right and what is wrong Oh, this is right now This is wrong This is right This is wrong There's now questions about what You know, identity And what pronouns And what you know, uh, 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 labels you're going to have. These are all questions and, and, and statements that you're going to hear about in school and all kinds of environments. What marriage looks like, what a healthy lifestyle looks like, what the body is, and all of those questions simply put in the school of Ibrahim, in the model of Ibrahim, in the lifestyle of Ibrahim, this imam that is the imam of the Muslims, the great, 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 great fra- grandfather of the Prophet wasallam. And the first to use the word Muslim onto himself and onto his family. And he's the one who actually called us. Who was Samakum al Muslimun? The one who called us Muslims. He believed that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the right to tell me what to do with my body, what to do with my life, how to live my life, how to, how to get married, how to make choices, how to prioritize, because he's the one who's given me that life to begin with. Nobody else has the right to change that, to redefine that, or to re-articulate that except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah tested him. And he gave up a lot. At a young age, he looked at his family. He says, إِذْ قَالَ لِأَبِيهِ وَقَوْمِهِ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ What are you worshipping? He said to his parents. He said to his, his, his community. Imagine as a young person, he turned around and says, Guys, this doesn't make sense. Why do you worship idols that are made out of rock? And of course, they tried to hurt him, so he left it all behind after teaching them an important lesson. He broke the idols, left the big axe on the biggest of them, and he said, guys, if you worship these things, ask him, ask the big one. Maybe he's the one who did it. He said, oh, the idols don't move. They don't have will. They don't have choice. Like, well, why do you worship something which doesn't move? And then he went to travel. He said, you know, I'm, I'm done with this. I'm leaving this. I'm going to go look for guidance. in dhahibun illa rabbi sayahdeen. And when he went looking for guidance, he came across people that were worshipping the stars and the moons and objects in the, in the heaven. He said, guys, maybe you're right. Maybe the moon is what's to be worshipped. Oh, look, the moon is gone. The moon is no longer visible. Maybe the stars, but the stars come to a point where they're no longer visible. Maybe the sun, well, it comes to a point where it's no longer visible. The one that I worship cannot be changing, has to be constant. It cannot be created. It cannot be something that needs other things to stay alive or to stay or to, to come into existence. I worship the one who has brought everything into existence. And I don't worship anybody besides him. And when it came to the biggest test with his own son, after waiting for years, for years, when Allah asked him, after waiting for years and finally now he has a son, he's old enough to walk, he's old enough to talk, He's old enough to be with him. He's able, old enough to have a conversation. He's a young adult. Allah tests him. Are you willing to let go of what you love most for Allah? And he passed that test. He passed that test. And Allah gave him an animal instead to be sacrificed. And in that he taught us nothing, nothing is more dear to me in my heart, in my life, in my commitments than Allah. Allah has that number one place. Why? Because He's my creator. He's the one who made me. Right? My parents brought me into existence, but Allah created me. My parents give me food, but Allah made the food. 
My parents provide me shelter, but Allah is the source of shelter. My society teaches, but Allah is the best of teachers. My teacher's guide, but Allah is the ultimate guide. He's the Rabb. He's the Khaliq. And it's him and it's he that deserves that. Ala lahu al wal amr. So now more than ever as young people, we need to study the story of Ibrahim. And that's the takeaway from this khutbah today. Welcome to the masjid. This is your home. This is the place where you belong. This is the place where you should smile. This is the place where you should ask questions. This is your home. And at the same time, it's the place where we all need to grow, where we need to ask questions and learn what does it mean to be Muslim. And if we want to know what it means to be Muslim, we study the story of Ibrahim, especially at this time, the time of Hajj. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us all to walk through the steps of Ibrahim, to implement the sunnah of Ibrahim, to follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and to be from those who are guided and those who are a source of guidance for others. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم السائل المسلمين فاستغفروا لنا الغفور الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على من اصطفى اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وبارك اللهم لنا في ما عطيت وقنا وصرف عنا برحمتك الشر ما قضيت اللهم اهدنا واهدي بنا وجعلنا مهتدين اللهم بارك لنا وفينا وعلينا وجعلنا مباركين اللهم قبلنا وتقبل منا وجعلنا مقبولين اللهم اهدي شبابنا ونساءنا ورجالنا واغفر لوالدينا وارحمهم كما ربونا صغارا اللهم اغفر للمسلمين وللمسلمات وارحم المؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات إنك سميع قريب مجيب الدعوات اللهم لا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا اللهم اجعل القرآن العظيم ربيع قلوبنا ونور صدورنا وجلاء أحزاننا وذهاب همومنا وغمومنا اللهم كن مع المستضعفين المسلمين في كل مكان يا رب العالمين اللهم كن معهم في السودان اللهم كن معهم في كل مكان يا رب العالمين اللهم كن لهم ولا تكن عليهم يا رب العالمين اللهم كن لهم ولا تكن عليهم يا رب العالمين اللهم كن معهم في فلسطين اللهم كن معهم في غزة اللهم انصرهم يا رب على من عداهم ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا يا رب العالمين عباد الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان ويتاء ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون واقم الصلاه ان الصلاه كانت على المؤمنين كتابا موقوتا. استووا مستقيم وتراصوا اعتدلوا سدوا الخلل اتصلوا ولا تختلفوا. Please try to accommodate the brothers and sisters. We do have a large crowd in the back. If there's any space that you can accommodate, please do accommodate. Allah الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا ضالين امين انا اعطيناك الكوثر فصل لربك وانحر ان شانئك هو الابتر الله الله الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين إذا جاء نصر الله والفتح ورأيت الناس يدخلون في دين الله أفواجا فسبح بحمد ربك واستغفره إنه كان توابا